In Athens is a place called the Ari, uh, Ariacopus or Mars Hill. And uh, in the time of Paul, the first century church, the Greek philosophers would gather at this location. These uh, men that were men of renown, the smartest men in their culture, they would gather together to discuss the intellectual matters of their day. They would muse these things. They would uh, give their interpretation about the issues of life. Paul went to, to Mars Hill. In order to get to Mars Hill, it's obviously on a hill, and as, as he walked up the hill, the road that would go up on each side of the road, all the way up, there would be altars and pedestals with uh, pagan gods on it. Each, you know, and all, of the, all the way up, and it's quite a long road, where they had gathered all of these uh, gods, and uh, you know, they boasted of having all of them. And there was one place that he went to, and the inscription there was the unknown God. And when he got to Mars Hill, and uh, you know, these Greek philosophers in their arrogant intellectual way were trying to intimidate him, and he said to them, I, I perceive that you men are very religious. The one I want to talk to you about is the one that is the unknown God. And then he proceeded to tell them about the creator of the universe. And, and you know, he witnessed to them about the greatness of the truth of who Yahweh is as the one true God. Uh, in many respects, I feel like in this class and maybe perhaps with our ministry, that w we have somewhat of, the, of a similar mission in that uh, the one true God is, for the most part, the unknown God. He is known by very few. Very few seem to really understand what the Bible says about the true God. Most people today have come to, or if not all people, as I said last week, have come to a conclusion about God. Most of it, uh, of their conclusions have, have come from their own uh, minds, the, their own thinking, and, and which has been uh, influenced by the worldview and the, uh, the musings of uh, intellectual carnal men that have had their sway on society, uh, but not from the Bible. And because it's not from the Bible, God remains, the true God remains unknown. So tonight's teaching I, I've titled The Unknown God. Uh, in our quest to understand Yahweh, I'm going to share some of the things that I've, I, obviously I've shared before with in, you know, many different settings. And, and I kind of want to put it all together in one, one teaching tonight, uh, explaining the name of God. We, want to, we, we have drawn the conclusions that we have about this God and uh, His name and His attributes and all of that are about Him. We've drawn our conclusions from the study of the Scriptures. Right, wrong, or indifferent, everything that we believe, we want it to be substantiated from the Scripture. Actually, we want the Scripture to be the platform for what we believe. And we're going to start in Leviticus chapter 11, a verse that we ended in or looked at last week. I don't know if we ended in that verse, but we looked at it last week. In Leviticus chapter 11, Yahweh is God's name. And it's, it's used 208 times, or 281 times in the book of Leviticus. God, the word God, is the, word, is the Hebrew word Elohim, is only used 46 times in the book of Leviticus. So the name Yahweh is used 281 times, and the, and the title God is used 46 times. It's obvious from this that the preference is placed on Yahweh rather than using the name God or the title God. And this is not only true in the book of Leviticus, this is true throughout the whole of the Old Testament in that the name Yahweh is repeated some approximately 7,000 times. This is something that God wants His people to know. He wants people to know His name. In Leviticus 11, in verse 44, it says, I am the Lord. 11.44, I am the Lord. The two words, the Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, D, are the one Hebrew word, Yahweh. I, I am Yahweh, your God. Consecrate yourself before me and be holy for I am holy. 
And you shall not make yourselves unclean with any swarming things that swarm on the earth. For I am Yahweh, who brought you out from the land of Egypt to be your God. Thus you shall be holy, for I am holy. Turn to chapter 19. In this section here, God identifies himself as Yahweh. And when he brought, when he brought Israel out of Egypt, uh, he identified himself. While they were in Egypt, they had exposure to many false gods and needed to clearly understand that Yahweh was the one true God. And uh, we see, and we're not looking at the book of Exodus, but if we were, we see that this, this great event, which really revealed to the people of Israel, to the Egyptians, and to the world, that the, the, the true God's name is Yahweh, that Yahweh is the true God. In Leviticus 19.36, you shall have just balances, just weights, a just ephah, and a just hen. I am Yahweh your God, who brought you out from the land of Egypt. You shall thus observe all my statutes and all my ordinances, and do them. I am Yahweh. Next week we're going to look at the subject of Yahweh, the, ap the absolute, absolutely just God. And uh, we're going to look at how how justice is such a very important part of who our God is and how he operates with humanity. Here we see again that he says to them, I am Yahweh who brought you out from the land of Egypt. He's telling them, look, don't be a conniver, don't be a thief, do things right, do them just, don't cheat, because I am Yahweh. And I brought you out of Egypt I'm going to take care of you now if you do it my way. That's the essence of what he's saying. But again, he brings it back to their attention that he's the God that brought them out of Egypt. This is a big thing that he wants them to remember. Look at chapter 22, Leviticus 22. In verse 32, you shall not profane my holy name. But I will be sanctified among the sons of Israel. I am Yahweh who sanctifies you, who brought you out from the land of Egypt to be your God. I am Yahweh. Look at the redundancy. I am Yahweh. I brought you out from the land of Egypt to be your God. I brought you out so I could be your God. And I am Yahweh. So you would know clearly who, who he is. 2343. Leviticus 23, verse 43. Well, let's look at 41 first. You shall thus celebrate it as a feast to the Lord seven days. This is talking about the Feast of Booths. It shall be a perpetual statue throughout your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. In this in these, uh, chapter, in this chapter, in these couple of chapters here, God explains the three annual feasts that he wants the, the children of Israel to observe for every year and to continue on observing. This feast that he's talking about now is the Feast of Booths. And uh, verse 42, You shall live in booths for seven days. All the native born in Israel shall live in booths, so that your generations may know that I am the sons of that I had the sons of Israel live in booths when I brought them out from the land of Egypt. I am Yahweh your God. He had them, uh, and it's the, the Jewish people today, many of them still observe this feast, where they will build a, a booth or a tent in their backyard, and for this week long, they stay in that. And uh, they were supposed to do this from generation to generation, year after year, uh, that they, a week-long celebration called the Feast of Booths. And the purpose of it was so that they would remember that he is the one that took them out of Egypt. And it also, the Feast of Booths, points towards uh, the time that uh, the Messiah would come back. Uh, again, emphasis on God wanting them to remember that he is the one that took them out of Egypt. 25, chapter 25, verse 55. <clears throat> verse 
For the sons of Israel are my servants. They are my servants whom I brought out from the land of Egypt. I am Yahweh your God. And it says, it says a similar... We, I wanted to look at... Uh, I skipped one. 23. Or did I... I think we looked at that, did we? Yeah, we looked at 23. All right. And then you can look at 26.13 and 26.45, where God says again and again that he is the one who brought them out of Egypt. The reason that this event was so significant and so important, it was at this time that he made known to humanity, he made himself known to humanity like he had not been known before. This was truly a turning point in the history of humanity. Before this time, uh, it seemed that very few understood who he was. There was, and there was very little understanding of who he was. And then with the exodus from Egypt, God reveals himself in a fashion and in a manner that, that people could grasp more fully who the one true God was or, and is. Um, Moses said to God, when, when, when uh, God commissioned Moses, Moses said to God, Behold, <clears throat> I am going to the sons of Israel, and I will say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God had said to Moses, I want you to go to the children of Israel. Tell them that I sent you. And then I want you to go to Pharaoh. Tell him that I sent you. And I want you to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt. So he had to go introduce himself to the Israelites. And he introduced, introduced himself to Pharaoh and convince both parties that this was going to be so. And Moses' question was a good question. Well, when Israel says to me, who are you? What is your name? What do I say to them? The response to this is in Exodus chapter 3, which I have on this chart here. God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am, which is the Hebrew word Hayah, has sent me to you. God furthermore said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, The Lord, and again, the Lord is the one word, Yahweh. You shall say to the sons of Israel, Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And this is my memorial name to all generations. The words, I am, are translated from the Hebrew word, Haya, H-A-Y-A-H, uh, which is, which is, a to, it is the to, to be verb. It's the, the to be verb. What am I? It is, I'm having a hard time saying that. It is the to be verb. Translated elsewhere um, in the Bible, 75 times for that matter, uh, as was or come, come to pass, came, has been, were happening, become, pertaineth, and a better for thee. But here they translated that to be verb, haya, as I am. And I think it was to be, I think it was a wise translation. Because uh, in this context, God is indeed always I am. He is always the existing one. He is the eternal one. But I am is not God's name. Rather, it is what he is or where he is. He, you know, it's, it's, a, it's explaining to you about him. It's not telling you his name. His name is revealed in verse 15. Again, the English words, the Lord, are the Hebrew word Yahweh. God's name is Yahweh, which means the existing one, the eternal one. Again, look at verse 15 in, on, the, uh, on the chart there. Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, Yahweh, answering Moses' question, his question was, what shall I say to them? What is your name? Tell them, Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name. Forever. This is my memorial name to all generations. That is his name. And it hasn't changed and it will not change. Look at Exodus chapter 6. Exodus chapter 6. <coughs> In verse 2. 
When a person sins, that's Leviticus 6. Exodus 6, 2. God spoke, spoke further to Moses and said to him, I am Yahweh. And I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, Yahweh, I did not make myself known to them. If you go back and you read Genesis, where the records are about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the name Yahweh will be written there. But it's it, it, because the, uh, the narrator, which is Moses, is explaining what is going on. And, you know, God gave him the revelation to write the word Yahweh. But he did not tell Abraham, he didn't tell Isaac, and he didn't tell Jacob, my name is Yahweh. He never told them that. He revealed himself to them as Almighty God. He first reveals himself by name to Moses in the records that we're reading right now. And that's... that's uh, with verse 3, says, I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty, but by my name, Yahweh, I did not make myself them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they sojourned. Furthermore, I have heard the groanings of the sons of Israel, because the Egyptians are holding them in bondage, and I have remembered my covenant. So therefore, to the sons of Israel, I... Say, therefore, to the sons of Israel, I am Yahweh, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from their bondage. I will also redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. Then I will take you for my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am Yahweh your God. I mean, that's so clear, crystal clear. I will take you from my people. I will be your God, and you shall know, you shall know that I am Yahweh your God, who brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And I will bring you unto the land which I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, and I will give it to you for possession. I am Yahweh. You see here on this chart, the Hebrew lettering for the word Yahweh, which is literally translated Y-H-W-H. Uh, and it, we believe it to be pronounced, most of the scholars are in agreement with this, as Yahweh. By adding the A and the E, the vowel sounds, uh, you can't say Y-H-W-H, but they most believe that it's pronounced Yahweh. That's where this name comes from. <clears throat> You know, people are called by many different things. People have different titles. Uh, mother, father, doctor, plumber, Mr., Mrs., Mr. You know, there's, there's lots of these different titles. And maybe each one of these titles reveals a different aspect of a person's life. So it is with God. God is called many, many things in the Scriptures. Well, not many, many things. He's called many things in the Scriptures. It's not an unlimited things. But there, he's called, for example... Uh, Eli, Elohim, which is translated into the English God. He's, he's called Elion, which is translated into the English the Most High God. He is called El Shaddai. It's a familiar term in the Christian circles. El Shaddai means Almighty God. He's, he's called El, again, which is translated God. These are all different titles for God. For who he, you know, different titles that he has, which explains different aspects of his life. He is the Almighty God. He is the Most High God. There are, and there's, there's many other titles that he has. But his name is Yahweh. All of these titles reveal some aspect of his magnificence. Nevertheless, his name is Yahweh. In the English Bible, Yahweh was translated Lord, all in caps. So that, we, so that it would distinguish it and so that you would know when you're reading it in English that it is the word Yahweh. Again, on, the, uh, on the, the board up here, it says in Exodus 6.3, I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob as God Almighty, but by my name Yahweh, I did not make myself known to them. Hosea 12.5 says, Even the Lord Yahweh, the God of hosts, 
the Lord, Yahweh, is his name. Psalm 83, 18. That they may know that you alone, whose name is Yahweh, are the most high over all the earth. Isaiah 42, 8. I am Yahweh. That is my name. And that's about as clear as you can get. You know, that is my name. I will not give my honor to another nor my praise to graven images. Isaiah 51, 15. For I am Yahweh your God, who stirs up the sea and its waves roar. Yahweh of hosts is his name. Jeremiah 33, 2. Uh, 33, 2. Yeah. Thus saith Yahweh who made the earth. Yahweh who formed it to establish it. Yahweh is his name. So, I mean, it's the, it says it over and over throughout the scripture. This is his name. Look at Leviticus 18, please. And yet, it's been pretty well obscure. Very few seem to understand that God has a name and that that name is Yahweh. It's a hidden name and it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be the unknown name. It should be a name that is known, and it's a name that should be revered and glorified and exalted and all these other things. Uh, but yet it's a name that is, for the most part, unknown. He's even called other names with authority which are not his name, such as Jehovah. There's, uh, there's, there's scores of people that believe his name is Jehovah, or Jehovah, but Again, that is not what the scriptures teach. That is not what it says. Jehovah is a is a made it's a made up name that the Masoretes made up uh, many many years after the writing of the scripture. <clears throat> In Leviticus 18, it says, "The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, I am Yahweh your God. You shall not do." what is done in the land of Egypt where you lived, nor are you to do what is done in the land of Canaan where I am bringing you. You shall not walk in their statutes. You are to perform my judgments and keep my statutes, to live in, in accord with them. I am Yahweh your God. So you shall keep my statutes and my judgments, by which a man may live if he does them. I am Yahweh. None of you shall approach any blood relative of his to uncover nakedness. I am Yahweh. I just wanted to show you a pattern that is, is consistent throughout the books of Moses, especially Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, where God gives a command for his people to do a certain thing, and then he, he qualifies it by saying to them, listen, I am Yahweh, or I am Yahweh your God. So do what I'm telling you to do. I'm God. I know what I'm talking about. My name is Yahweh. Do it. And uh, it, it's the redundancy that is so apparent causes us to, to, to conclude that God really wants us to know his name. And uh, it shouldn't be obscure to us. It should be very much a part of our awareness. In Leviticus 18.21, you shall not give any of your offspring to offer them to Moloch, nor shall you profane the name of your God. I am Yahweh. To worship Moloch was disgusting because he was a false god requiring the sacrifice of children. They would burn their children alive in worship of Moloch. And to have any connection at all with Yahweh is... Uh, repugnant. And he said, don't profane my name by associating with Moloch or having anything to do with him. In chapter 19, verse 12. You shall not swear falsely by my name so as to profane the name of your God. I am Yahweh. So swearing falsely by his name is a manner in which we could profane his name. Worshipping Moloch and being connected with Yahweh would profane his name. And profaning his name is not something we would want to do. In chapter 20, verse 3. 
I will set my face against the man, that man, and will cut him off from among his people because he has given some of his offspring to Moloch so as to defile my sanctuary and to profane my holy name. Again, defiling, defiling the sanctuary of God is profaning his name. 21.6. Am I going too fast? Or? You're all right. 21.6. They shall be holy to their God and not profane the name of their God. For they present the offering by fire to the Lord, the food of their God, so they shall be holy. This is in reference to regulations concerning the priests. They should follow these regulations so as to not profane the name of God. Look at chapter 22. 22.2 Tell Aaron and his sons to be careful with the holy gifts of the sons of Israel, which they dedicate to me, so as to not to profane my holy name. I am Yahweh. His name is holy. And we talked about holiness last week. His name is holy. There's no, there's no other word that we could use that would be any holier than God's name. It is a holy name. And, and, and we should be careful not to profane it. We are looking at different ways in which he warned them to behave so as, or to not behave, so as to not profane this name. Um, in 30, 32, 22, 32. You shall not profane my, name, my holy name, but I will sanctify among the sons of Israel. But I will be sanctified among the sons of Israel. He'll be set apart. He'll be, he'll be revered. He'll be reverenced. He'll be sanctified. He'll be elevated. He'll be put on a pedestal, so to speak, in our minds. I am Yahweh who sanctifies you, who brought you out from the land of Egypt. To be your God, I am Yahweh. And then uh, 24, 10. <clears throat> now the son of Israel, woman, now the son of an Israelite woman, whose father was an Egyptian, went out among the sons of Israel. And the Israelites' woman's son and a man of Israel struggled with each other in the camp. So the, this, this, this son, his mother was an Israelite, but his father was an Egyptian. Verse 11, the son of the Israelite woman <coughs> blasphemed the name and cursed. So they brought him to Moses. Verse 12, they put him in custody so that the command of the Lord might be made clear to them. Then Yahweh spoke to Moses saying, bring the one who has cursed outside the camp and let all who hear, who heard him, lay their hands on his head. Then let all the congregation stone him. You shall speak to the sons of Israel saying, if anyone curses his God, then he shall bear his sin. Moreover, the one who blasphemes the name of Yahweh shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall certainly stone him, the alien as well as the native. When the blasphemes, when he blasphemes the name, when he blasphemes the name, shall be put to death. So obviously God has a very deep concern that his name not be blasphemed. The third commandment in Exodus 20 verse 7 is, you shall not take the name Yahweh, your God, in vain, for Yahweh will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. Obviously, if the name, if God's name was used in a fashion to you know, that it would be cursed or anything like this, you see how severe he was about keeping his name holy. The substitute for the word Lord, again with a capital L and an O and an R and a D, in the English Bibles for Yahweh is believed to be due to the concern not to violate this commandment, this third commandment. And, and you know, because of the things that we have read. 
The thought was they did not want to profane the name of Yahweh. So let's not use the name of Yahweh. Instead, let's use the word Lord. And, um, but the practical effects has been the loss of God's glorious name. God gives many instructions and commandments regarding His name. However, He never told people not to use His name. Quite contrary to that. The Scriptures clearly and emphatically and repeatedly communicate just the opposite. That His name should be known, it should be talked about, it should be revered, it sh and we'll see these verses in a minute. His name is not something to not be used. They're, they didn't profane the name of God by using it the wrong way. That's not what we just read. The name of God was profaned when they worshipped Moloch. When they, when they made an oath that they didn't keep. You know, when they cursed in that. You know, there was, these were the ways in which they profaned the name. It was an extreme act on the Israelites' part, or on somebody's part, to decide not to use Yahweh and to go with a, a substitute for the word Lord. In the Hebrew, they substituted with the, the uh, word Adonai or Adonai. And uh, again, the practical ramifications of that is a, of generation after generation after generation of people not knowing who God's name or not knowing God's name. He became the unknown God, the unnamed God. So, you know, I, I looked up the word name in the dictionary this morning. And uh, this is what uh, Webster's Dictionary says about name. A word or a group of words by which a person, a thing, an animal, a class, or a concept is distinctively known or referred to. Especially the proper appellation of a person or a family. And the, the phrase that really got me in that definition of the word, of the of of the word name is a distinctively to distinctively know or refer to the name Yahweh distinctively makes known to the world who God is so that there can be no misunderstanding ever especially when you read the redundancy that there is in the scripture over and over and over and over in 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 the fashion which I'm reading to you now I'm, I'm we're only looking at the book of Leviticus you know, we're going to look at some of these places elsewhere, but um, he wants that name to be known. It's, it's his, that's how we identify who he is. You know that who I am, and you, you associate that with my name. You, you know, when you say Vince and I'm not there, a mind picture comes to you of who I am. It's my identity. Yahweh is our God's identity. That is his name. When Jesus taught his disciples to pray, he magnified that which was and should always be of concern to those who love God. He said, hollow, hollow be your name. Those who came before Jesus <coughs> also acknowledged the holiness and the, sacred to, the sacredness of his name. Isaiah said, indeed, while following the way of your judgments... Yahweh, we have waited for you eagerly. Your name, even your memory, is the desire of our souls. He also said, Isaiah also said, O oh, Yahweh, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will give thanks to your name. How can you give thanks to his name if you don't know it? Jeremiah said, who shows loving kindness to thousands, but repays the iniquities of the fathers into the bosom of their children after them? O oh, great and mighty God, Yahweh of hosts is his name. Ezekiel wrote on behalf of God, My holy name I will make known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let my holy name be profaned any more. And the nations will know that I am Yahweh, the Holy One in Israel. Daniel said, Let the name of God be blessed forever and ever, for wisdom and power belongeth to Him. 
Hosea said, even Yahweh, the God of hosts, Yahweh is his name. Zechariah said, and Yahweh will be king over all the earth. In the day, Yahweh will be the only one. And his name, the only one. That's the day when Christ comes back. Malachi said, For from the rising of the sun, even to its setting, my name will be great among the nations. And in every place, incense is going to be offered to my name. And a grain offering that is pure for my name will be great among the nations, says Yahweh of hosts. In studying how the name of God was lost. I, I read many commentaries and uh, many theologians and many different people's opinions of when this took place. I searched the scriptures to understand when in the scriptures, if there was a time in the scriptures that uh, they stopped using this name. Or if there was any instruction where God said to stop using this name. And to my knowledge, there is nothing at all that comes even close to God putting a prohibition on his name or saying not to use his name. And, and again, I'll show you so uh, authoritatively uh, by going over many scriptures that God wants his name understood and used. It, wasn't, it was obviously in, the, in that it was written so many times in the Old Testament, it was used during the time of the people when they were there. It was thought that maybe after Israel went into exile. This is far into Israel's history. This is long after. I, we, know, we know that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob didn't know his name. It was first revealed to Moses. But then the descendants of Moses would have continued to understand the name. David knew the name. David indeed knew, knew the name of God. I didn't look it up, but the word Yahweh has got to be written hundreds upon hundreds of times in the Psalms. David being the primary writer of the Psalms. And uh, David's son, and all the way through. And then Israel went into captivity. They went into captivity because of idolatry. They, were, they got into a polyistic beliefs. They were believing in, in different gods, Baal and, and uh, the golden calf. They went into exile. After 70 years in exile, they came back to Israel, never again to give themselves over to such idolatrous ways. They never, as far as I know, they did not... You know, in the history of the Bible, that's what's in the Bible, they didn't go back to idolatry. Some believe that it was at that time that they came back and they decided not to use the name Yahweh any longer. But the scriptures doesn't bear that out because there are books that are written after the exile. Nehemiah, for example, Ezra. And in the book of Nehemiah and Ezra, the name of God again is used frequently and it, it speaks about using his name and speaking his name and glorifying his name and these type of things. So it wasn't excluded in the time of the exile. We believe that the last book that was written, the book of Malachi, is indeed at the end of, you know, that the Old Testament time. It's in uh, maybe approximately 400 years before Jesus. The book of Malachi, the name of Yahweh is used maybe 40 times. It's used over and over and over again. So in the time of Malachi, they were still using the name. And then, um, then it was thought that maybe in the time uh, between Malachi and Jesus, that there would be uh, this prohibition on the name. Well, again, history does not bear that out. Because if you look at the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation... In there, the name of God has changed. It's changed from uh, Yahweh to Kyrios. But the writings that are associated with that, that were written with it, the, which are called the Acrop... Uh, uh, what do you call them, John? Apocrypha, thank you. The Apocrypha, the name of God is used over and over and over and over again. So at the, the name is still being known and understood at that time, which is a couple hundred years before Christ. Jesus certainly knew the name of God. He said he made his name, he made the name of God known to his disciples. I have made your name known to your disciples. So I, I can't show you from a biblical point of view when they stopped using the name. 
I, you know, what we have are English Bibles. We don't have a Hebrew Bible sitting in front of us. If we had a Hebrew Bible sitting in front of us, and if we read Hebrew, we would see those Hebrew letters that I showed you written over and over and over and over again. Now, in the Greek, when they wrote the New Testament, they, they changed these names, all of them to Kyrios, which was, you know... I, I don't know if that was biblically or uh, uh, godly inspired or how that came to pass, but I am certain that they knew God's name. When they read in the synagogues and when they read in the temples from the Old Testament, they didn't change God's name to Lord. When Jesus read from Isaiah to explain to people who he was and what his mission was, he read the same thing that Isaiah said uh, because he read from the Hebrew manuscripts. So I, I, I'm not sure when in history this change came to pass. And there's a, there's a, many people have many different opinions. I, I, don't have, I don't have a way of discerning accurately history. I have a way of discerning accurately the Bible because it's in my hands. I have the Spirit of God within me and I can read it and work it and study it. And I have for a long time. And it is very apparent that the name of God is not to be forgotten or unknown, that we should know it. Now, after we take a break, we're going to look at some of the many places that God encourages us to use His name. But first, we're going to take a break. So, help yourself in the back.